Amen. God, glory to you in the highest, because you are the most high God, the one true God, Lord, that created everything, that holds everything together. And we thank you, Lord, for this day, this time together. May our voices, as we've raised them, be a blessing to you. May this time in your word be blessed by you. And Holy Spirit, may you move among us, open our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts, that we may hear your word and apply it to our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, hey, good morning, everyone. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. We're going to look at one particular verse today in 2 Timothy. All right, so I made a joke uh, talking about Celebrate Recovery and uh, about, uh, what did I say, the three things that I thought of uh, was anger and uh, eating and gambling. Uh, first off, if I was a gambler, I'd be awful at it because I always root for the underdog. Um, but I don't gamble. Um, I do uh, have a difficulty saying no to any form of chocolate, and, and I know that needs to change. And I know that as I'm 45 years old and looking at the downside of uh, the rest of my life, uh, green things are okay to eat. I have to convince myself of that. So, so I do have dietary issues. Anger, um, I don't punch holes in walls anymore, but I do uh, still get my, uh, where's Donnell, my amygdala hijacked, a uh, little part in your brain that uh, controls anger for stupid things. Okay, If you need a Bible, raise your hand as I'm talking about this. Dan's got Bibles there uh, to open to 2 Timothy. Um, so, you, you know, like, it's like, oh, we don't have words on the screen. And, like, you know, I'm like, I want to, just like, oh, it's so frustrating. And, you know, I can get so uh, angry about things like that and little things like that. And so I really need some assistance uh, in my life to, to enlighten me. And, of course, God does that. Because uh, as we're sitting here, you know, when Tom said, I know we don't have words on the screen, but just saying da-da-da. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah. Gee, talk about first world problems. We don't have words on the screen because the heating in this building was too much for the projector to handle. And so the projector shut down because of that. At, at least we have a building. At least we have heat. At least we can gather together without fear of uh, government interference to worship God, you know. First world problems. We don't have words on the screen. So what? We got God. We got the Bible. We got each other. We got a comfortable building to be in. Uh, and so that, uh, that certainly set me right. But those things are in the Bible. And as we are uh, talking about uh, the Bible today, the title of this is Handbook for Preparedness. That's in your bulletin there. Uh, referring to this, the Bible. So uh, we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, particularly verse 316. This is a year of preparation, and what does that mean? What are we preparing for? Well, we're preparing for eternity, because that's what we're going to do, is spend our lives in eternity with God in heaven. And so as we're preparing for that, this is the handbook. This is the foundation of, of our church, of, of everything that we want to look at. It needs to be such a, a part of our lives that anytime we think about things, anytime we want to make decisions, anytime we're seeking guidance, anytime we're seeking comfort, anytime we're seeking anything, we should seek it from God's Word. In, in his book, Knowing God, that's the title of the book, J.I. Packer, he's a theologian, he writes... What were we made for? And he answers, to know God. What aim should we set ourselves in life? To know God. What is the eternal life that Jesus gives? Knowledge of God. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17, 3. Knowing God. God. And of course, his whole book is about knowing God. But that should be our aim, and that's part of our preparation. That's the hugest part of our preparation, is knowing God. When we start to know God more and fully and completely, uh, everything else starts to fall into place. And so, uh, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3.16, hang on, I'm reading a bunch of different things in the Bible, so let me go back there. 
2 Timothy 3.16, he writes, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So what part of scripture is profitable for knowing God? All. All scripture is profitable. Profitable, not useful. I'm sure some of your translations say useful. In fact, that's how I memorize that verse. All scripture is useful for this. But really, the Greek word is profitable. And it just sounds Ferengi, and so we don't want to use that word. We want to use useful. That was a Star Trek reference, Ferengi, right? Uh, but all scripture is profitable. That is the word. Not just useful. Beyond that, it is profitable. That means that it heaps up. That means that when you invest into it, you get a bigger return. So when you invest time in scripture, you get a bigger return. It is profitable for all these things. More than merely useful, it is profitable. So you gain abundantly more than you give. So as we prepare uh, for 2015 uh, and beyond, we're going to spend time reading, studying, and reflecting upon the Bible. That's going to be our foundation, and that's what's going to be important in our lives. So how can the Bible prepare us for 2015 and beyond? And like I said, some answers are in 2 Timothy 3.16, but let me read uh, the whole chapter because it's only 17 verses. So Paul is writing to his mentee, his, his, his junior guy, Timothy, and he says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Does that sound like anybody you know? Does that sound like any society that we know? Does that sound like modern day? Avoid such people, Paul writes. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. So he says, this is what's going on, this is what's going to happen, avoid that, and now let me tell you what you need to do. You, in verse 10, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord, or yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for your salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That, anything with Paul and Timothy is, is discipleship. Jesus said, go and make disciples, teaching them all I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That, that is our job as Christians. Right? That is our mission as a church. Make disciples, if you wanted to sum it up in two things. And so what Paul says is, you've followed me, you've seen me, he, he, Paul, has lived that life that someone can follow. That is what a disciple is. Paul has lived a life for Christ. Paul has lived a godly, godly life following Jesus. And, and he says to Timothy, what I've done, you do the same thing. That's what being a disciple is. And you know the sacred writings, the scriptures, how useful they are. And then in verse 16, all, uh, all scripture is breathed out by God. That means it comes from God, inspired by God. God breathed out these scriptures and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for these things. So if we picture this road, this discipleship road of, of being uh, godly, being what God wants us to be, uh, and you can't see it, but it looks like this. <laughs> P picture this path. You're in your lane of, of righteousness, okay? And what the scriptures are useful for is teaching us this way, 
teaching us what God wants us to do. When we get out of our lane, when we stray off the path, we need something to tell us, hey, that's wrong. You've stepped off, okay? Reproof. It, it, you've done wrong. You've sinned. And then we also need to know how to get back on to that path, back into our lane. That's the correction and the training in righteousness is keeping us where God wants us to be. So what Scripture is useful for is, first off, uh, for teaching, for doctrine, profitable for teaching. Uh, the word teaching is the same as doctrine. Paul writes to Timothy, he tells him all scripture is breathed out as profitable for teaching. So that's teaching us about God. That's what doctrine is. Who is God? What is God like? What does God want? What does God desire? These things are doctrine. And so it's useful for teaching us about God, teaching us to know God. And when we begin to know God, when we begin to see his holiness, uh, to really understand him, it opens our eyes to a lot more things, uh, particularly things about us. So all scripture is inspired by God and useful for knowing God and teaching us about him, teaching us to know who God is. And the second thing it's useful for, he says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for reproof. Reproof. Uh, what that is is that the Bible gives us a spanking when we need it, okay? Um, it is that we know ourselves. When we, when we know God and his holiness and his perfection and his glory, it opens our eyes to who we really are. And when we see that, we recognize our sinful state and how that keeps us separated from God. And so this reproof uh, gives us a correction. It teaches us uh, to get back to God. In Romans chapter 7, verse 7, Paul illustrates this for us, so let's just stick with him. He's talking about the law, which is the law, Ten Commandments, Scripture, etc. What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet it, if, it had, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So scripture opens our eyes to see what sin is. It opens our eyes to see ourselves. When we see human beings uh, written about in scripture, we see the mistakes they made, the consequences of those things, how those things keep people away from God, draw people away from God, how people stumble. Uh, everybody stumbles. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what Romans says also. So we see that, and when we see what those things are, that's the, the reproof. That opens our eyes to see who we are in light of a holy and perfect God. The other thing that this is useful for is correction. By getting us back on track. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for correction. Okay. Um, to restore us to an upright state, to restore us to righteousness, to get us back there. Think of uh, it as a guide, a GPS, a roadmap. Siri, I'm lost, get me back on track. Well, stop doing what you're doing. Get on your knees, pray to God, <laughs> open the Bible, spend time studying it, All right? It's correction. Um, so when we see who God is, when we know God, teaching and doctrine, when we see who we are, the reproof, the correction, we're, we're off track, that correction, the next thing then, is this bridge to get us from here to him, to get us back into what God wants us to be. It points us to the cross, basically. When you see who God is in his holiness, when we see who we are in our sinfulness, we see that the only way to get there is the cross. Jesus Christ, that he bridged this gap. And so it, even if you're a Christian and you've been a Christian for 25 years and you've got half of the Bible memorized, you're still going to sin. And, and, and as you realize that and you study the Bible and you press into God, you realize that even that sin, even that sin that you commit tomorrow was forgiven 2,000 years ago on the cross. And pressing into that salvation, realizing that, uh, that gets us back heading in the direction where we need to be, getting us back on track. So, knowing God, knowing who we are, the bridge from here we are to him, and then the Bible is also profitable for training us in righteousness. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for training in righteousness. 
Now, uh, this, this is a combination of a word, training and righteousness. Uh, chastening, nurture, instruction, chastisement. Uh, basically, it refers to like the whole education and training of children. Now, sometimes when you're raising your kids, you say, don't do that, right? You're teaching them. Uh, don't, don't run out in the street. Don't do that. And when they do that, what do we have to do sometimes? Correct them, right? Hey, pay attention. I told you not to do that. Don't do that. Is it really that hot, Mom? Uh, and that's the training in righteousness. Keeps us on track. So it's that kind of thing that sometimes we teach the kids, sometimes we have to correct them. Uh, but it also then the righteousness, um, it's, it's how we ought to be. It, it's the condition acceptable to God. This is what training in righteousness is. Uh, the slide that I have here says, statistically speaking, 83% of all people who ignore the instruction found in God's word will find themselves in serious trouble at some point in their lives. The other 17% lie about it. And of course, you know that 77% of all statistics are made up on the spot or used as illustrations in preachers' messages. So, um, but basically, yeah, if... if <laughs> If you ignore the instruction in God's word, he talks about that, even in God's word, even if you're not reading it. The fool does this. Uh, you know. So uh, if we ignore it, then we're going to find ourselves in trouble. But this righteousness that we're training in, okay, it, 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 we are taught about God's, so we know who he is. He's holy and perfect and, and glory. Um, we see who we are in, in those reproofs, in those rebukes, in, in that sinfulness. We, we see how we can only get to God through Jesus Christ, that correction, the bridge, the cross. And then the training in righteousness is really when we start to see ourselves as God sees us. God doesn't see you as a sinful human being. God sees you as his creation. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all your sins are forgiven. And that's how God sees you. Even though you may stumble and fall and sin again, uh, when God looks at you on Judgment Day, when you're in Christ, he doesn't see that mess. He sees his son. He looks at you as who he sees you to be, which is a lot better than we see ourselves. And so that training in righteousness is to, to get us to start to see who we really are, who God really made us to be. He really made us to be someone who is created in his image, who is following his will. So, the scripture is important. The Bible is important. It's profitable. Is profitable useful? It's more than that, right? Profitable is more than useful. So the Bible is more than just useful. It is beneficial to us. It, it enriches us. It enhances our lives. It teaches us who God is. It, it teaches us about ourselves. It teaches us about Jesus Christ. Uh, sin separates us. Jesus Christ is that bridge that separates us, that, that builds us from here to God. Sin separates us from God. Jesus bridges that gap. And, and then helps us to see who God really sees us as. His creations. So, on your bulletin, this is written down. All scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. As you think about those things, which of those will you most need in 2015? And then there's also a plan of action. Write down what you think that will look like in your life. Like if you think, I need training in righteousness to answer the question, how do I live my life for God? Uh, that's what we're preparing for. So what does that look like in 2015? And then what are you going to do in 2015 to make that happen? Are you going to spend more time reading the Bible? Are you going to spend five minutes, an hour? Are you going to read through the whole Bible this year? Are you going to read through the whole Bible in 90 days? As we're going to do. There's also down at the bottom a scriptural reflection. And this week, reflect on 2 Timothy 3.16, memorizing it if you can. 
and then think about, this is the reflection part, what's Paul's view of Scripture versus your own? This is where you start to grow. Do I really look at the Bible as something that is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness? Or do I look at it as a paperweight to hold down all the papers on my desk? Do I think that, yeah, the Bible's important, but my actions speak differently? Am I not actually spending time in something that I think is important? And then on your communication card on the back, there's a commitment to read the Bible cover to cover in 90 days. In two weeks when we start that, January 18th, that's what we're doing. We're going through the Bible in 90 days. It can be done. A Bible like this, this is a large print, thin Bible, large print, because I am getting old, my eyes are going bad. You know, slightly over an inch thick, 12 pages a day will get you through this Bible in 90 days. And that's what we'll be teaching on. That's what some of the small groups will be. I'm going to do a small group on Sunday afternoons at 1 o'clock, talking about the things that we're studying, going through the Bible. But the reason behind all this, the preparation behind this, as the band comes up, um, sorry for the short notice. I want to see everybody's lives change. I want to see them change through the power of the gospel, through the power of Jesus Christ. A and how that happens can be specifically seen, specifically measured. There are thir certain things that you can do that will have that happen, that will help you to train yourself in righteousness, to have God work in your lives. The one of the most important things, in fact, at the top of the list, no matter where you are, whether you're, you're just learning about Jesus, whether you've been a, a Christian all your life, uh, and you live in your life for Christ, whether you're growing in your faith, no matter where you are, one of the most important things is to reflect on Scripture. Reflect on things in the Bible. And so that's why I say, think about this verse. Because now you're thinking about, well, how important is the Bible to me? Is it so important that I'm actually going to read it this year, cover to cover? Am I going to do it in 90 days? Or am I going to read it every day? Or am I just going to sit and listen when Mike reads it on Sunday mornings? Think about that reflection of Scripture. And then spending time in the Word, reading it, reading the Bible. These are two of the most important things. And so that is the preparation uh, for 2015. It's doing that. I'm going to do everything I can from up here to encourage you, to inspire you, to rebuke you, whatever it takes to get you that next step closer to God. And so reflecting on Scripture is one of the number one things to do. So think about that. Reflect on reflecting on Scripture. And then the rest of this week, reflect on Scripture. But now is the time uh, when we're going to continue worship uh, through some more music, but also through receiving the morning offering. Uh, this is how we worship God. We give back what He has so abundantly given us. Uh, if you're a guest with us today, please don't feel obligated to give. Uh, this is how members and regular tenders uh, give uh, back to God. This is how we support the ministry. This is how we see lives changed. Uh, last week, we heard so many testimonies about how God is working in lives. We watched Roman get baptized. Uh, it was just a fantastic thing. In fact, those testimonies that we played on video last week are on the YouTube channel for the video ministry for Antelope Springs Church, uh, so you can check them out anytime you want. But uh, now let me pray for the offering, and the ushers will pass the baskets, and we'll continue in worship. Father God, Lord, we love you, and we thank you for all that you give us. Uh, we thank you for your word, which here in America, uh, again, God, we, we have every opportunity to read it, to study it, to reflect on it. In other countries, that's not the case. In other countries, people are dying for sharing the Bible. And God, we don't, we don't want to take that for granted. We want to read and study your word and apply it to our lives and see it change us, Lord, to become more and more the people who you want us to be. And so, Father, the work of this church, the ministry of this church, is to see lives changed by the power of the gospel. And as we contribute, as we give back, Lord, what you've blessed us with, we ask that you take these offerings and bless them and multiply them for your glory. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>